Jai Guru, everyone. Jai Guru. Thank you. Jai Guru. And welcome to part 11 of chapter 12. We have the full A team here today. Priyank, Mike, Chris and myself. Are we feeling ready to dive in? I'm seeing some nods. Very, very ready. Very. good. Yeah. I love this part of the chapter because I feel like it really highlights Sri Teshwar's personality and the type of guru that he was, but also the the love and relationship that Guruji has with him. I think it's really beautiful. Um, so talking of love, the this section starts with saying, my guru could not be bribed even by love. And I wondered if this surprised any of you hearing that because I, I always remember hearing that love is above law, particularly with God, right? So I wondered how you felt about this and, you know, why you thought that could be. I think it speaks to me of somebody with very high principles and priorities. He knows himself, he knows the nature of the world so he's not going to be bribed even by the highest of all all uh, all that there is uh love um it is a bit of a perplexing kind of statement um, i remember when i first read it it kind of made me pause to think what does it actually mean because if you know we we hear uh, god being described as joy ever new bliss um i always thought or at least equated god with love like god is love so it is a bit of a you know perplexing statement even to this day when i think about it I'm not actually sure what it means i think it really is to say that let the love the lesser love let's say of that we experience in this life um, from friends and family versus the unconditional truly unconditional love of, of god that's sort of how i interpret it, it could be wrong um, but that's along the lines of what i was thinking It's also that Guruji didn't move in to a shared flat with a mate. He joined an ashram, right? Mm -hmm. And so he, there, he's not the only disciple that Sri Yukteswar has. So there's an ashram discipline. And then if we would join like a monk's order or the SRF ashram, we would also expect to be that there is a discipline and that it's quite strict. And Sri Yukteswar is especially strict, even for those kind of um, standards. Um, I'm at this point. I'm not surprised anymore, to be honest, because I, from what I've read from Sri Yukteswar at this point, I kind of expected something like that. I'm I'm wondering what he is trying to bribe him to do or coerce him into doing. Mm -hmm. um, is it uh, like preferential? service in the ashram for example i can think of the best thing that i'd probably like to do in a guru's ashram is to be his private secretary just like following mm. around taking notes all that kind of stuff um which begs the question which of the various ashram duties would each of you um, <laughs> like mm. to uh, bribe sri yukdesh for to give you <laughs> um, and would that change if it was bribing yogananda to give you <laughs> oh that's a good question Priyank way to put us on the spot <laughs> <clears throat> you know me list. <laughs> on, Mike. I, I would probably opt for um not not to overload myself with responsibility some I would be fine with some kind of repetitive task I don't have to be the face of the ashram or something like that I can be <laughs> somewhere in the background and learn slowly I, I know how from my experience i sometimes dive into a lot of big jobs and then i later find out that they are a bit overwhelming so i would just want to please guruji that's kind of what i would aim for and i would also hope that guruji would guide me into the right kind of jobs for me because i noticed that from serving with srf oftentimes they look at me and say oh this is a job 
or Michael could learn something, let's have him do this one rather than this is easy. Let's give him that. Yeah, mm, yeah rather mm. than, you know, what, what are you good at or what's your background actually just where, it, where are you needed? Yeah, they say mm. that, don't they? You know, when um, the monastics join the ashram, they're not necessarily placed where their careers were if they had a career before. They're just placed where, mm. they're, where they're needed. Um, but I love the idea of being placed somewhere where you could learn something. That's great. Wow. Mm. Very blessed, Mike. And I know when it comes to jobs, Guruji talks about this in his lessons. And he uh, really would say what Mike was saying. You know, you want to give yourself, give give everything to whatever it is that you're, is, is, is set in front of you. So I'll be with Mike wherever I'm asked to go I'll, I'll go you do it with a smile and all, all, all the rest of it would would come but definitely um to mike's point you know my initial comment was to joke about scrubbing the toilets because that would be you know even the lowliest of tasks sh shouldn't be beneath anyone but then really you want to be trying to move you know move your way through the world and have um other people to give the opportunity to other people to to do tasks to learn from so um, there is that to, uh, to to think about as well, but definitely when it comes to doing any task in the ashram, it would be a a blessing for sure. Maybe that's what some of the disciples were trying to bribe through Tesha with, you know, not to do those kind of tasks that other people <laughs> perhaps wouldn't want to do. Maybe that was it, because you know, I'm not I'm not sure if Guruji's talking about himself here when he says about not being bribed i'm not sure he's talking about other people or a culmination of the two i'm not sure there is a, maybe a funny story with guruji putting people through the tasks um that uh it, when, whenever i think it was at blake shrine whenever whenever they were doing the gardening and the story there where he was getting you know many volunteers to to do the the gardening tasks and getting them to you know plant here and then change and plant there and change and just make it, you know, put them, put them through the tasks. And um, they, uh, I think they were getting a bit fed up by the end of it, but it was all, it's all part of the training, really mental and the discipline and the loyalty and the, you know, a, a lot of this. So um, I'm sure it wouldn't be easy living in an ashram, doing it day after day after day, similar tasks or different tasks. But I think that that's all part of the training. Does Barbara get you to do that kind of thing when you're doing eco farm work? Like, <laughs> move that mound of dirt over there. No, no, it doesn't belong there. Over there. Over there. I'll put it this way: I'm well trained. <laughs> <laughs> It'd be suitable for Ashram life, then, Chris. <laughs> you got your pre-training in now. <laughs> um, but it also says here in the photography that Shri Tesha didn't even show any leniency to anyone who had willingly offered to do, become a disciple he says and I feel like you know you really need to know what you're getting into when you choose to become a disciple whether you're in the ashram or you're in the world there's a certain level of relationship and responsibility and um, willingness and surrender right that comes with that and there was a, a lovely uh, section that I found a speech that Guruji said uh, Mike would you mind please reading it out Paramahansa Yogananda described the Guru disciple relationship as a very personal and private spiritual bond a union of loyal spiritual endeavor on the part of the disciple and divine blessings bestowed by the Guru mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, Guruji goes on to say here, he says that, you know, he's describing Sri Tesha and how he was, and he was basically saying how no matter whether they were surrounded by lots of people or if him and his master were alone, he was always the same and he spoke plainly and upbraided sharply. And, you know, if Guruji or anyone else sort of lapsed into shallowness or was inconsistent in any way it never escaped his rebuke so it sounds like he was really um 
very keenly eyed on his devotees. It's quite a way to run an organization. I know when you work in a modern company these days, giving feedback in front of other people is a big no-no. You'd have to always give private feedback. So this is um, harder to take, I think, if you get if you get rebuked by in front of everybody. But yeah, <laughs> flattening to the ego approach. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And yeah, Priyank. Yeah, in SRF when we're serving. Oh, we have to be in a position to give feedback there with say um even if there's a million things that they may need feedback on just give them to say one or two of the main things because then it will be digestible as opposed to being overwhelmed with um uh, improvement areas <laughs> that you may you may be uh turn a bit uh sorrowful perhaps but obviously studio therefore had no um what concerns in that respect upbraided 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 sharply like mm. um you can imagine him saying you did this foolishly and then explaining why it was so foolish just going <laughs> to, to town on that <laughs> so yeah yeah and it's like you know there's, there wasn't anything that escaped that either you know he's not going to just let things slip you always have to be acting rightly right and Guruji said that this flattening to the ego treatment was hard to endure and then he goes on to say but he had this unchangeable resolve to allow his guru to iron out all my psychological kinks as he said yeah. and he said he he describes it as a titanic transformation that his guru was laboring at and that, you know, he shook under this disciplinary hammer many times. <clears throat> Priyank. The psychological kinks and he wouldn't, that the fact that he wouldn't allow shallowness or inconsistencies um, without rebuke. I was wondering what inconsistencies that he could be referring, what types of inconsistencies that he could be referring to. What do you guys think? Mike, do you have any ideas? He he mentioned a bit earlier in the book that he said um, he was often caught absent-minded and I have unorthodox approaches to to problems and <laughs> things like that. <laughs> so maybe maybe that, but um, I'm sure the psychological kink sounds like minute little things, right? That that uh, um, maybe show themselves rarely. And every time uh, it sounded like, sounds like Sri Yukteswar didn't need much of a trigger to, to give feedback. So. <laughs> yeah. mm. I wonder if also he's referring to, you know, sometimes it's easy for us to behave rightly when we're in conducive circumstances, but then, you know, mm. perhaps we might slip into our old ways if we're not, or, you know, it's just easy to slip back into our past habit bound self, right? So I wonder if that's what he's yeah. referring to as well. You know, it, even if he acted slightly towards his quote unquote lower nature or his past behavior, that that, that also was upbraided. Yeah. The, the way he describes it, um is also shows the attitude it's a very accepting attitude that mokunda has at this point and i think that's the only way you can endure treatment like that if you feel like this truly benefits me and the longer i endure this the more i will make progress on the spiritual path otherwise this sounds this would be just if if, you, if somebody would do this to you where you don't know that he is self-realized and knows exactly what he's doing it would be just hell i assume Mm. I was really inspired actually reading that line when he says my unchangeable resolve was to allow Sri Yukteswar mm. to iron out my psychological kinks and you know I was thinking about myself and you know my own relationship with the path and Guruji and I thought actually that's how I would love to be too you know it, Guruji might not be physically here but 
his advice and his instructions are everywhere particularly in the lessons right and to have that that really strong resolve to really absorb everything that Guruji has, has taught us and to allow that to iron out all the kinks as it were mm -hmm. I heard something along the lines of offering say criticism or critique in a constructive way really is by and large reserved for loved ones and that's maybe why loved ones we are so hard, hard on each other really <laughs> because we kind of have the the um let's say the flexibility we know that we can say things that might otherwise fray a relationship um, because the relationship is so strong um, with loved ones. Um, and no greater a, a bond, let's say, in this life do we have than with the Guru. And Guruji himself was, in this way, pretty similar to some of his disciples, his devotees, his followers. You know, there are many stories about how he would talk um, at times and seemed very harsh to certain devotees, certain disciples in his flock um, as well. And many people maybe didn't know how to take it or didn't understand it, but it was received in a similar way. I think Sri Dayamata, maybe if I'm not mistaken, he spoke quite quite firmly with in many occasions. So um, it seems like this is maybe a, a trait. And when I think about it, I think of these elemental aspects, you know, this element of fire, you know, very, very strong within us. And maybe that's sometimes needed uh, in order to uproot whatever, whatever kinks and things like that are in our psyche that need to be uprooted. Mm. And the guru knows best. Exactly. Right. And that's what makes a relationship so special because you know that it's all for our highest good. It's such a divine relationship. And there's um, a, a section in the Second Coming of Christ which, talk, which talks about the relationship between the guru and disciple. Priyank, would you like to read that out, please? Yeah, sure. The spiritual soul contact between the guru and the disciple is one of eternal, unconditional, divine love and friendship, bearing no taint of any selfish consideration. Human love is conditional and based upon merit and inborn attachments. Unconditional divine love is the Christ love with which God embraces all his children, high or low, naughty or good, under all circumstances. Only a master, one who has cast off his ego with its biases and selfish expectations, is capable of serving as a perfect channel through which God's divine love may flow without measure. This is from Discourse 9, from the Second Coming of Christ. Mm. And we see um, such a good example of this divine love in the next paragraph, where Sri Uteshwar says, If you don't like my words, you are at liberty to leave any time, Master assured me. I want nothing from you but your own improvement. Stay only if you feel benefited. And I love that word assured. You know, it wasn't, it didn't feel sort of sharp or dismissive in any way. It feels like, well, you know, actually, if you can leave if you want to, you know, and that's real love, isn't it? You know, you're not binding to anyone. You're just saying, well, you know, if this benefits you, then stay, <clears throat> which of course Master did, thankfully, for all of us. Um, doesn't bear thinking about does it the uh, <laughs> alternative and Guruji says that he's immeasurably grateful for the humbling blows he dealt my vanity and then comes this which I think is quite a famous line only because I've heard it so many times in the wake but uh, the awake documentary he says I sometimes felt that metaphorically he was discovering and uprooting every diseased tooth in my jaw hmm. And then it goes on to say, you know, it's very difficult to dislodge egotism except rudely. And um, when when it is dislodged, then the divine can come, but it can't come 
who it can't percolate, percolate through flinty hearts of selfishness. This is this is like really, really, really tough um, uh, approach, isn't it, to a guru, to mm. a disciple relationship? Um, this is such a not not I wouldn't say harsh, but such a like um, detail orientated guru, isn't it? And what a fantastic way of describing all these quite painful experiences, probably for that to the ashram ashramites experienced um and you note that there's a bit of repetition here um in terms of different ways of describing essentially how harsh Sri Yukteswar was um but uh, it, it, it is important and uh, even the Bhagavad Gita often uh you know Arjuna will ask a single question but Krishna will describe the answer once and then a second way a different way a third way a different way so he'll say the same thing but many different ways so Arjuna might hope to he might hope that Arjuna answers or understands one of those things I think and personally I I really like the the um point here where it says the hard core of egotism is difficult to dislodge except rudely um, I think that rudely part um, rings home to me. I'm often described as quite a rude, rude person, but I like to take this uh, line to heart, <laughs> to my defence. That surprises me, Priyank. <laughs> I don't think you're rude at all. <laughs> this is inner inner monologue, his inner conscience. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh. And then uh, it carries on, doesn't it, about, to t- tell us more about Sri Yukteswar. I love it. It gives us such a, an insight into his character. And it said that his intuition was penetrating and that he often replied to one's unexpressed thoughts. And then it's basically saying, you know, the thoughts that a person has and what they say is often pulls apart. It's quite different. And he advised Guruji that by calmness, try to feel the thoughts behind the confusion of men's verbiage. And I was going to ask you if you all tried to do this, but we actually had a very good example of this post recording from Priyank. (laughs) Because um, I hope you don't mind me saying Chris, but Chris was running behind because he had some things to, to deal with at home. And, you know, he let us know. And Priyank said, oh, well, I think we're okay to re- record without him. And Mike said, oh, where did, where did he say that? We're like, oh, I don't think he did. And then it transpired, you know, maybe Priyank was actually reading in between the lines, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> so now can you reveal, did you mean that or not? <laughs> you know, it's funny you say this, um, because if I didn't say it, I meant to say it. Oh wow! See, Priyank. Wow. Yeah. What you what you don't know is, as soon as he messages, he's gonna be late. Oh, it's on the phone to him and shout, shouting at him and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> no, he wasn't. <laughs> he was on video. We saw you, Priyank. <laughs> yeah, that's interesting it, because um, yeah. I think I had written it mentally, gen- genuinely, but oh. I didn't actually get around to. This, wow. I think so. Yeah. and it is a skill I, isn't I it to, Go on, Mike, i use yeah. the old school approach where you actually read the words that people write <laughs> <laughs> you're so you're so cali, cali yeah guess. i was gonna say that exactly <laughs> 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 oh. but it's such an important thing to do because so many of us yeah we don't really say what we mean right and there's so much behind our speech and it's a good reminder actually for me to you know try more to actually say exactly what is meant right um but it's it's also lovely when we can like Priyank you have those moments where you can actually understand what someone means without them even saying it Mm. and uh sometimes you don't need to have a conversation do you it's just nice to just inwardly know what each other are thinking or feeling or um, why they're sad or all that kind of stuff or why they're really why they're really happy but I really like this 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 section about the essentially it's about 
harmony, isn't it? I.e. saying that the um, unexpressed thoughts and the words or even the words that someone uses and the actual thought behind them are poles sometimes apart. And then he's, the key line here is by calmness, try to feel the thoughts behind the confusion of men's verbiage. And that's really important because um, with your family and friends, often if um, you know, if the situation is tense or there's something that's really stressful, people aren't necessarily very good with their verbiage during those times. Um, but you should, if you know the person well, um, and you've you know you've had a history with them, then you should know what they mean and what they feel, what they should say rather than what they did say. Um, and sometimes what they did say is often you know painful, perhaps, and they may have said it wrong. They perhaps even may have sworn all that kind of stuff. But um, if you get behind the that you know gross facade and see what was actually going on in their hearts and often there's solace and comfort for yourself and it's such a great way to ensure that within yourself you can sustain harmony with those around you even if they're not necessarily being harmonious outwardly mm. i'm gonna i'm gonna um talk to the other side of that coin as well because if you're not a fully realized guru you cannot always rely on your intuition and um, especially with loved ones, if you have a mis if if you have a heated argument or something like that, I talked to I was counseled by monks sometimes when I had problems, and they often told me to, to be really clear in your communication and don't leave anything to this kind of nonverbal approach where you think they should understand what I'm saying, even though you're not saying it because they might not and after years and years, you learn each other really well, but it's never perfect unless you're Sri Yukteswar, I think. <laughs> so I think, I think there is something to be said to, especially when it's, when, when the, when it's really important that communication is clear and encompasses everything you want to say. Yeah, um, I was actually getting counseled by a monk just a few days ago, actually, and it was really late at night. And I told him, um, can we do this in the morning? He's like, oh, don't worry, it's not going to take long. And I was like, fine, let's do it now. And so we were having a conversation um, and I had like 10 things that I had a problem with um, in the scenario. And he said, um, that's too many. You just, just picked like two or three of the most important ones. Like really, really make it really simple and really concise and just give those. And then don't, don't say, he said, don't... Um, don't like demand it he said just offer it for their consideration mm. and then if they decide to go against your what you you know sincerely want or are offering then you just have to leave it to god and guru as he said because at that point uh, mm. all you're going to do is create more and more disharmony if you keep harboring if you keep harping on um, I, know, I know you guys don't have the context here but uh, if i give the context it might um uh no, no, I won't. I won't say the context. <laughs> <laughs> well, offline, maybe. <laughs> offline, <laughs> offline, maybe. <laughs> I, I guess. I guess it might be difficult to deliver ten points of criticism. That might be. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm skilled, mate. I've been doing that my whole life. <laughs> uh, I love that notion of offering something, though. That mm. that feels much softer and more full of love actually rather than like you know directing something at someone it's like well here's what I'm going to offer you and if you want to take it okay and if you want to leave it okay there's nothing else I can do well. there yeah mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. you know in a slightly uh slightly more jovial tone um there's a lot that you can do to play with this and I think like a, a lot of fun that you can kind of have uh with with this whole subject because it is such a groundbreaking kind of subject where are we talking about telepathy you know what are we talking about here um and we probably all have this in our daily lives where we kind of think of somebody suddenly out of the blue they call or you know we haven't thought about somebody in a while and they, they message um and we have we all have this ability so you know you can actually work on that and build 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 on that right if if you so wanted to so although when when i read this with shri Dishwar penetrating 
his his thoughts just to go back to what was said there like he often replied to one's own expressed thoughts that seems supernatural doesn't it but this is all within our ability and, and all, all as maybe prank read into my mind earlier on in this daily daily life when we're in sync with people uh, in in our uh, surroundings we do this daily without recognizing it without knowing it um so this is what Sri Akteshwar has perfected through this stillness of, of mind. Um, and uh, yeah, maybe maybe we could play with that idea by sending people signals and see, see if they receive them or something um, in, in, our, in our daily life. Mm. And I must say, I did practice Mike's, uh, the counseling approach that Mike um, had received from one of the monastics, like before this, um, I'm in Egypt right now and the Wi-Fi is exceptionally dodgy and I've got four of my family members here with me and they're all on Wi-Fi doing various things that aren't as important as this podcast, clearly. So I said to them, I'm going to start this podcast right now and I need all of you to switch off your Wi-Fi. And then I went around and switched off their Wi-Fi. From <laughs> <their phones. laughs> They all, Did you course, ask agree. them or, or tell them? Um, um, yeah, a bit of a hybrid, I would say. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's very you. <laughs> it's endearing, I have to say. <laughs> My mother-in-law uh, still doesn't understand what a podcast is, and uh, uh, even though I forwarded her this. Well, maybe <laughs> one day. <laughs> She'll know. No, <laughs> and speaking of podcasts, um, we have more <laughs> of the chapter to cover. So we go on now to what I would call the severe ways of Sri Teshwa. And it starts by saying basically how, you know, when one such as Sri Teshwa discloses what he has divine insight of, it's often quite painful for people to hear and that he wasn't very popular with students who were quite superficial but for those who were wise always few in number said so Guruji and they deeply revered him and I feel like this really highlights the difference doesn't it between a superficial seeker and a sincere seeker you know if you're really sincere actually those disclosures to the wise are like divine music even however harsh you know and they're willing to undergo and endure that fire mm. this <clears throat> this this comment about the wise always few in number deeply referring him i was thinking back then it was few in number um you know this was a hundred years ago and we were in the ascending Dwapura Yuga and you know consciousness is at a certain state but now we're 100 years on so that few in number maybe probably a few more maybe 100 percent more because you know you might have had you may have had uh, 20 ashram inmates now if Sri Yukteswar was, was around maybe you'd have 40 I don't know or maybe it would rise exponentially or to the square who knows but there'd definitely be more because we're in an ascending age, aren't we, Mike? Mm. Yeah, we are. I don't know how you guys feel when you get criticized, but you know there is merit to it, or you know this comes the other person is sending this from a person of, from a position of truth or from a position of love. How you react, and I I can describe this in me. I I see this sometimes. I. My first reaction is always the ego comes out and says, no, you're wrong. And then later I have to catch myself and, and then um, uh, calibrate my reaction. Is that the same? Is that normal or is that just me? Yeah, I feel like that's pretty normal, Mike. I feel that's yeah, pretty okay. normal. I think, for, you know, for some people, maybe it's it's a, either a shorter time or a longer time between mm -hmm. the reaction and the response. But, you know, the ego is going to be bruised if it's being shouted at, mm -hmm. right, or uprooted. It's going to feel a pang. So however quickly 
one goes between that feeling and the switch of oh actually I know what's going on here and it's it's just the ego doing its thing um but yeah yeah and uh, I, I love the next line is <laughs> here she says that you know I dare say Sri Teshwa would have been the most sought after guru in India had his speech not been so candid and so censorious. And it's just, it sums up Sri Teshwa, doesn't it, in that line. And I, I love this, I love this candidness and sensor, censoriousness mm -hmm. description because it feels like, you know, Sri Teshwa is always pointing out faults, you know, and he's always very harsh with it, but actually they're full of truth and they're full of love. And, you know, that might not be, uh, that might not be what some people would like to endure. <laughs> and perhaps that's why he didn't have so many devotees. But, you know, in some ways, actually us on this, or in many ways, us on this path, right, of SRF, we are, devotees of Sri Teshwa. so we too are ready in whichever way to receive his fire yeah funny that you say that I uh, mentioned the word fire because I feel Sri Teshwa is a yogi from a really high plane and as we know when, you, when we as further along in the book he says he um, Guruji asks him if he will reincarnate and he's like yes but on a higher plane and I will have um, disciples that are also higher evolved so I guess maybe that's more what he is used to and his standards are very high and his standards might be very high for this world we're in maybe that's one way to explain um, um, why, he, why he is like he is here and why maybe that's not for all devotees maybe for some of them that's those fires are burning a bit too hot mm. higher plane obviously we're referring to is um in hiranya loka uh, hiranya loka yes yes where he returned yeah. uh, going to be a glorious episode when we discuss that mm. um mm -hmm. the i think he, he was he said that um only you know only devotees that have passed the nirvikalpa state of samadhi um are eligible for Hiranya Loka, mm -hmm. um, Hiranya Loka entry. It's the entry requirements. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> so, so, and there you'd imagine that ego is much less or perhaps not non existent, um, you know, the gross, gross ego um, rather than the soul ego. Um, so here, there, um, he would be able to speak very plainly without upsetting people and all that kind of stuff that he would get here. So I think that's the guru that we see here. He's not changing his ways um, just to uh, suit the uh, environment which he's um, been asked to be born into now in this uh, incarnation. But uh, someone, someone wise always told me that um, <clears throat> we've got six gurus to choose from, right? Uh, it's not just <laughs> Paramahansa Yogananda. And if this is the, if Sri Yukteswar is candid and uh, severe approach is the one that works best for us, then that is the person, that's the guru that we should pay all of our, you know, attention and focus to. And similarly, you know, if Larry Masha is yoga avatar, nature appeals to us most than there, and Babaji and Krishna and Christ and so forth. So yeah, so you've got an option, you know, one of six you can choose to really hone in on and um, connect with for your own liberation in this life. Mm. I often find that if I if I'm in need of a particular approach for a particular thing that I'm trying to overcome or face in life, then I'll be drawn to a particular guru. And often, if it's something that I need to really just overcome and get rid of, Sri Teshwar is <laughs> is the one for me because he's just so severe and clear cut, and there's no there's no sort of uh i want to say softness but actually i feel like you know it does come from a place of love in in many ways so it does feel soft in that way but it's very on on the nose right 
and uh, he does actually say that you know he's really hard he's hard on those that come for training and that he doesn't as you were saying Frank, he doesn't compromise he says take it or leave it i never compromise and i was thinking on this because you know often even in day-to-day -day life we adapt our approach to suit who we're talking with and i'm sure that you know Guruji and many of the great masters, you know, even in subtle ways, probably kind of adapted certain certain ways to suit certain devotees and their, you know, leanings. And I'm I'm curious that you know, take it or leave it. I never compromise. You know that he <laughs> he doesn't alter his approach. He's just like, well, this is the way. So you either want to or you mm -hmm. don't. Um, one thing that makes Sri Yukteswar especially endearing to me is the way Yogananda describes him, especially in, in this chapter and in some of the following chapters. He is a real declaration of love, right, to mm -hmm. towards Sri Yukteswar. And whenever I think of Sri Yukteswar, I think of him through the eyes of Guruji, of Yogananda. And that makes it like a... Like a we know that he's strict, but um, he also describes the love that is behind this discipline that he's giving. And he also wants the good for his disciples. It's not like uh, it's strict to no end. So I think if you read the autobiography of a yogi, especially I think all the four of us and many people who are listening to this podcast, we are real fans of this book and read it more than once. And and the Sri the the Sri Yukteswar, the more you read about him, the more you kind of fall in love with him as a guru. I would think. <clears throat> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And he also says to Guruji that, you know, he recognizes the difference between them both as gurus. And, you know, this is when he's not even become a quote unquote guru yet, although in some ways he is a guru because we know that he met his first disciple didn't he? And uh, gave initiation. So in some ways he really is a guru um, and always was. But he said, you will be much kinder to your disciples. And that is your way. I try to purify only in fires of severity. These are searing beyond the average toleration. Mm. The, um, the various ways of Sri Yukteswar is um, described here, but it's also described in the Second Coming of Christ in Discourse 9 again. Um, Mike, do you want to start reading? It's a really good section, actually, to bolster what we have here in the autobiography. My guru, Sri Yukteswar, said to me, when he accepted me for training, allow me to discipline you, for freedom of will does not consist in doing things according to the dictates of prenatal or postnatal habits or of mental whims, but in acting according to the suggestions of wisdom and free choice. If you tune in your will with mine, you will find freedom. In attunement with his God-guided wisdom, guided will, I did find freedom. Sri Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, comprehending that wisdom from a guru, thou wilt not again fall into delusion even if thou art the chief sinner among all sinners yet by the soul raft of wisdom thou shalt safely cross the sea of sin one who is spiritually ill-equipped to pilot the boat of his own will through rough seas will surely founder but if he clings to the wisdom raft of the guru's guidance he will reach safe harbor. A guru disciplines the disciple only until the latter can guide himself through his own unfolding soul wisdom. The, the God-sent guru has no selfish interest, only the highest interest of the disciple. Everyone needs a psychological mirror in order to see the blemishes that have become an accustomed and favored part of the acquired personality of one's second nature. The guru severs 
serves as this mirror. He holds up the devotee, all, he holds up to the devotee a reflection of the perfect soul image over which are superimposed the flaws of the ego that are yet mar perfection. In ways both open and subtle, the guru brings to the fore in the disciple, in the disciple lessons to be learned that perhaps for incarnations have lain shelved in the dusty corners of the consciousness. In an inevitable sooner or later choice, the devotee accepts and learns or bulks and avoids those abominations. Wiser for the learning, he moves nearer to the free, to freedom, obstinate in ego comfort. Delusion continues to hold him tightly. Very few persons enjoy true freedom of will. To follow one's desires, compelled by the dictates of instincts and habits, or to be good and refrain from evil simply because one has become accustomed to that good behavior, is not freedom. When the will is guided by discriminative wisdom to choose good instead of evil in any and every instance, then indeed is one is one free. Harnessed to wisdom, no longer swayed by prejudice and error or by the influences of hereditary prenatal or postnatal habits, family and social and world environments, the will becomes established in righteousness. Until then, the way to all righteousness lies in the following the wisdom, guidance and sadhana of a master who is divinely empowered to bestow enlightenment to others on others. Such was the master recognized by the disciple of Jesus, who began one by one to seek the spiritual shelter of, in his grace and blessings. Mm. It's very powerful. There's so much in there to take away, isn't there? Yeah. Wow. It's kind of like the number one thing when you speak to, say, a lay person who doesn't meditate, isn't into, into yoga. They say, oh, I could never fill in the blank. You know, I could never sit in one place. I could never, you know, meditate for long enough. I could never fast. I could, it's just a, a permanent fixture and a rejection of change isn't it so it seems to be the constant <laughs> when you speak to people um which is interesting then that this sort of tackles that doesn't it um you know, i remember speaking to somebody and they say that's just the way i am so <laughs> you know this this identification is it's very real mm. but we see here don't we that it can be changed through severity and the fire or the gentle approach of love, which Sri Yukteswar describes as equally transfiguring. And he says the inflexible and the yielding methods are equally effective if applied with wisdom. Mm -hmm. And I wondered what method you would prefer, the, or that you do prefer. Is it the, the, the love, loving ways? the gentle approach of love from Guruji, or do you prefer the severe fire of Sri Yukteswar? I think, Lauren, you have to go around the room and say which one you think we would prefer. I'm sure Ooh. you'll get it. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. Put, some, put, some, put some judgment in there. Yes. Okay. <laughs> divine, <laughs> divine judgment. No ego. Yeah. Divine judgment, yes, yes. Okay, well, I would guess for Priyank, Shri chick, smart chick. And Guruji for Mike and Chris. Am I correct? I don't know about Chris. I think that's right for Mike. <laughs> are, we, are we saying just between the two? Or are we looking at all six gurus? You have to pick, pick <laughs> one between the two. Binary choice in this instance. Binary choice. Okay. Well, you know, but it, it's what they represent that kind of fiery <laughs> severity or the, the softer, loving, yielding. yielding approach. For me, right now, for sure, I think we're probably talking about stages, right? And in in this part, 
we we see that um, the guru is there until the disciple can sort of do it on their own, mm. right, go on their own. Mm. And so that speaks to me that there's a time and a place. So time and a place right now for me, for you, for sure. <laughs> uh, um, that discipline is is always uh, always welcome, but sometimes more than others. Ooh. Was she right with you, Mike? I mean, see, at the, the at the end of the day, it's just a delivery method, but the <laughs> message is the same, right? So, yeah, 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 it is. I, yeah, it's I don't true. really think it makes that much of a difference at the end. Yeah. I mean, if you are new to the guru and he he deals you those humbling blows, you might go like, "Who is this person, and why is he so mean to me?" But once you get used to it, I don't know if you you'll you'll just know you'll get something so yeah either either or is fine i guess so lauren you got one perfectly correct one probably wrong and mike halfway house so did yeah. all right did all right all right but not really <laughs> <laughs> for you lauren i would say you are the guru yoga and the yielding approach what do you think uh Yes, yes, I think so. I was thinking about this quite a lot because, you know, oftentimes I I really enjoy the Sri Teshwa approach and I find that to be very invigorating in getting me to commit and, you know, be very uh, strict with my sadhana. But I was thinking actually, really, Guruji's ways are, are likely to to be more long lasting i think for me because <laughs> because actually if, if if i really reflect on it could i really endure that that level of severity from sri Yukteswar? it like it's is it's one thing to say oh yeah yeah sure i could i love mm. it but actually could i and mm. if i could then he would be my guru right my my ultimate guru but it's Guruji for me. So and and that that's why, because I obviously need that level of, of love to <laughs> um, to to get me on the path and to keep me going. Yeah, the spirit of all the gurus percolate throughout oh, the practices. yeah. So we get yeah. we get a really good balance. Mm. Um, but uh yeah, there's it's it like you said, Lauren, it's not for the faint of heart this uh, same discipline and Guruji himself even as a master really struggled with it from time to time right and he even says to his guru in later times that we'll talk about like he's looking for certain words from him he's looking for from his guru to give him certain you know a certain type of love for attention and affection and that um, is challenging right to, to look for something of an approval of sorts from a disciplinary and you know it's it's definitely not easy and Guruji tells us that in so many so many ways yeah good good point about um each of them have the quality each of the gurus have each of the other gurus qualities because um you know the direct disciples of Guruji and their you know recounts of their life with master uh Paramahansa Yogananda I'm talking about they all they all most of them reflect and say they mentioned the severity that they experienced in terms of, um, you know, how they, not just how they, how their sadhana was, but how they served with him and how, um, what his expectations were and all that. So in many ways, when they describe Yogananda, it's like uh, exactly as Sri Yukteswar is being described here. So Yogananda was very much capable of going into Sri Yukteswar beast mode um, as, as, as and when he <laughs> needed to. But um this is i don't think this is the case for all paths so in um um in other paths like, that, like for example pure bhakti traditions that don't have um you know this uh really big introspection vibe in terms of uh, really you know focusing on improvement and severity and tests and things like that the pure bhakti tra traditions actually fully fully go into the yield approach they don't um, necessarily go you know 
do the spectrum as we're getting experienced here. And I think that's probably what distinguishes the Kriya and the Raja Yoga path because Raja Yoga is the royal yoga. Yeah? It includes all the other um, yoga branches, i.e. Um, uh, Gnan, which is wisdom, Bhakti, which is devotion, Kriya, which is energy, and Karma, which is uh, action. So we're blessed to um, to be here. Yeah, and I just wanted to say that if you join an ashram or if you're on the spiritual path and if you're a seeker, you will probably come with some measure of humility and with some measure of self-awareness, I think. And it's that it's definitely needed on the spiritual path. And and you will expect some correcting feedback. And if you find it's it's too much, I mean the Sri Yukteswar himself says that um, um, if like he's he's just saying it as it is, but there are other gurus who are much nicer to their students, <laughs> and it but it might also be slower than right. It might also mm -hmm. take longer um, if you if you can't get over your ego as quickly as some other people. That might be um, uh, you might be uh, uh, might take longer for you to reach on the path of self-realization mm. yeah something that i was also thinking when you were talking Priyank, you were talking about um paramahansa yogananda being quite severe with some of his devotees and i wondered do you think that was the sri yukteswar coming out in him or do you think that was <laughs> his that was his sort of loving way right and then imagine Sri Yukteswar's way like if that's severe to us what would Sri Yukteswar <laughs> be like <laughs> and you know he, you know he does say here and um, Sri Yukteswar does say to Guruji you know you'll go to foreign lands obviously he's talking about America and so on and so forth where blunt assaults on the ego are not appreciated <laughs> and you know a teacher could not spread India's message in the west without an ample fund of accommodative patience and forbearance, <laughs> like Guruji says in brackets, I refuse to say how often in America I have remembered Master's words. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, he really, he really kept kept on with that forbearance, forbearance and love, doesn't he? Yeah, Mike. It's a really difficult um, uh, balance you have to strike there. You go to this foreign land as a person from India teaching uh, a co concept that is foreign to most people. But at the same time, you have those messages that are blows to people's ego. You're telling them you're living your life all wrong. You should <laughs> do all this different. Right? <laughs> and somehow you need to attract people in and then also send that message out um, so it needed a real diplomat, and I guess that's what Gurji was. We um, we Westerners are such sissies, aren't we? Especially as described here in these two paragraphs. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Let's accept our <laughs> accept our medicine. Let's move on. Let's move on. Next. Next <laughs> Snowflakes. Snowflakes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I wonder why that is if it's a cultural thing you know we've been brought up with these you know modes of quote unquote politeness and you know ways of being that perhaps the west doesn't have what do you reckon Chris you know when I, when I thought about this I thought the pinnacle might be Japan you know whenever Mike said earlier on about not giving criticism or feedback in a workplace I know that Japan is notorious for that. Like you do not ever um, say disrespect or dishonor somebody in that sense. So maybe it actually has, and Japan has a very strong attachment to, to honor um, in, in, their, in their culture. And maybe that is the same to some degree in the West. Um, but how it skips India, I don't know if it, if it does skip India at all in between. <laughs> I, I'm not sure how that works, but, um, you know, I, I would take it as an honor thing. You know, don't mm. disrespect somebody, you know, seemingly, you know, put somebody 
um, on in the spotlight in front of others because it might put them in a in a lesser, weaker position, something something like that. Yeah, yeah. And I think you know the the beautiful thing with Sri Tashra and Guruji is that you know people have willingly decided to be there, right? As he said earlier, so you've said, okay, well. I'm I'm up for you flattening my ego, but for those who haven't and are just trying to live their everyday lives, you know, working in an office or something, that's not appropriate or applicable for them, is it? Just want to say some good things about Japan because they have um, this tradition of very strong discipline and also a lot of respect for the elders and then a lot of respect for merit. So they have Usually when there is um, something like a martial art or m many, many old school professions from the Middle Ages, there would be people on different levels and they would respect each other. And so they, they have, a, they have a, a whole legacy of, of that. But yeah, that's also, I'm not sure the feedback culture might not be the, the best one when, if it's like, yeah, like you said, Chris. Yeah. Mm. Well, perhaps it is, you know, perhaps that's what goes hand in hand. It's that that respect, mm. that honour, that, you know, yeah. real nod to, well, you know, I respect you, so I'm not going to say such and such. Um, uh, and then going back to the chapter, so he said, he describes Shri Teshwar's speech as undissembling. So it really paints an image, doesn't it, of what his speech was like. And he says, you know, basically to say that his undissembling speech prevented a, a large following, but an ever-growing number of sincere students of his teaching, no, through an ever-growing number of sincere students of his teachings, his spirit lives on in the world today, as we feel and have discussed. And then we're going to end the section that we're going through today with Warriors like Alexander the Great seek sovereignty over the soil. Masters like Sri Yukteswar win a father dominion in men's souls. Very nice. I'm not too far from Alexandria speaking from where I am right now. <laughs> <laughs> Going back to the Japan, okay. Mike. I haven't been to Japan. My only experience of the discipline of which you speak is Mr. Miyagi. <laughs> exactly. Wipe Wipe on. <laughs> wipes on, wipes off, right? Yeah. He was quite severe with his feedback, wasn't he? With Daniel Sun. <laughs> Bianca, you might have to explain for those of us like me who have no idea what Kar you're talking about. Karate kids. Very popular oh. movie. Yes. Okay. No, yeah. way before <laughs> Lauren's time. Like, come on. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. this, it's, this a, it's, a, it's an evergreen classic. Yeah. Oh, got the Net Netflix TV series. Oh. Yeah, they made uh -huh. uh, Cobra Kai. They made a Netflix TV series, but yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you for enlightening me. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I has got his head in yeah, his but... hands like he's in shame. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic film. Oh, okay. Yeah, this sorry, this end bit. Where it says masters like Shri Yukteswar would win a farther domain in men's souls. <clears throat> this sums up really why he is the way he is. You know, it really sums this whole part up for us, doesn't it? He's not seeking kind of a scattergun approach or to have many followers. He knows in his own way that Yogananda and others would have been able to carry the teachings and go on and do what they do. So um Shri Kishwar already knew this through his mentionings to Yogananda. So um whenever I had a thought in my mind, and maybe it's this these weaker moments where we think you yeah, have somebody you know, soul is enlightened as great as Shri Kishwar. Could they not save so many more souls, you know, in their time there, you know, just to be slightly more different and take in people and help change them and you know, do more to change others um, in their time here on, on earth. But that's speaking to something that simply my consciousness, my mind does not understand. It cannot grapple with 
ideas like this. So here's the sort of the secret, you know, it's the farther dominion in men's souls is quality over quantity. Let's say it's having people come to him, not the other way around. So, yeah. Mm. Really yeah. So, so it imply that um, Alexander's great, Alexander the Great's victories over, you know, land and kingdoms was yeah. not as impressive as winning reign over like even a few of men's souls, uh, i.e., transforming a few souls and being the cause of their self-realization is a far greater victory, which is quite a beautiful thought. Um, so, sorry, Alexander, you lose. Yeah, I feel like it's become a pattern in this book that Alexander the Great's not being held in high <laughs> regard. <laughs> yeah. I feel like this uh, section of the chapter is really given me i don't know it feels like he's given me a bit more spiritual vigor to be honest reading about Sri Deshwar, i feel more more yeah in vigor so i'm very glad for it this podcast always brings out what i need to hear and learn and there's so much to learn from and we're going to carry on with the chapter it's a lovely long chapter so more sections to go next week uh Priyank. Yeah, just one final thing. So about Sri Paramahansa Yogananda's approach with us um, in the West and uh, obviously some YSS devotees in India as well um, mm -hmm. is is kind of exemplif completely exemplified in, in his poem, God's Boatman, isn't it? Um, you know, the time, the, the, the word, some of the words are, you know, I'll, I'll come in again and again with bleeding feet to you know, save one if one last uh, disciple is left behind, etc. So it's, you know this his approach to the divine love that he shares with us is um is not just comforting it's like something that you can completely put all your faith and rely on isn't it but it's a beautiful poem if you haven't read it god's god's boat man i think really exemplifies our guru's um approach to us and his love for us divine love shall we read it out if you've got it to hand I do. I Go can quickly. I can quickly get it and put it on here, and then we can read it. Oh, oh no! Oh, I tried. <laughs> I can read it out. Well, yeah, you read it. Yeah, you read it. Yeah. Okay. I want to ply my boat many times across the Gulf after death and return to earth's shores from my home in heaven. I want to load my boat with those waiting thirsty ones who are left behind and carry them by the opal pool of iridescent joy where my father distri distributes his all desire quenching liquid peace. Oh, I will come again and again, crossing a million crags of suffering. With bleeding feet, I will come if need be, a trillion times, so long as I know one stray brother is left behind. Mm. I want thee, O oh God, that I may give thee to all. I want salvation, that I may give it to all. Free me then, O oh God, from the bondage of the body, that I may show others how they can free themselves. I want thine everlasting bliss, only that I may share it with others, that I may show all my brothers the way to happiness forever and forever in thee. Tiger. <laughs>